Hey friends, Dean here. Before we get you on to your episode, I want to take a moment to invite you to our next virtual online trivia night. Wednesday, May 13th at 8 p.m. Join us either on our Facebook group or on our YouTube page for three rounds of fun trivia, music questions, movie questions, general knowledge questions. It'll be a fun time and a chance to win some prizes and have just a good relaxing night uh, of some trivia at, at home. You don't even have to go out for it. So don't forget, Wednesday, March 13th at 8 p.m., Join us on our Facebook group or YouTube for three rounds of fun virtual online trivia. We'll see you there. Is There a Santa Claus? by Jacob Reese. Dear Mr. Reese, a little chap of six on the western frontier writes to us, Will you please tell me if there's a Santa Claus? Papa says not. Won't you answer him? That was the message that came to me from an editor last December, just as I was going on a journey. Why he sent it to me, I don't know. Perhaps it was because when I was a little chap, my home was way up toward that white north where even the little boys ride in sleds behind reindeer, as they are the only horses they have. Perhaps it was because when I was a young lad, I knew Hans Christian Andersen, who surely ought to know, and spoke his tongue. Perhaps it was both. I will ask the editor when I see him. Meanwhile, here was his letter, with Christmas right at the door, and, as I said, I was going on a journey. I buttoned it up in my greatcoat along with a lot of other letters I didn't have time to read, and I thought as I went to the depot, what a pity it was that my little friend's papa should have forgotten about Santa Claus. We big people do forget the strangest way, and then we haven't got a bit of a good time anymore. No Santa Claus. If you had asked that car full of people, I would have liked to hear the answers they would have given you. No Santa Claus. Why, there was scarce a man in the lot who didn't carry a bundle that looked as if it just had tumbled out of his sleigh. I felt of one slyly, and it was a boy's sled. A flexible flyer. I know because he left one at our house the Christmas before, and I distinctly heard the rattling of a pair of skates in that box in the next seat. They were all good-natured, every one, though the train was behind time. That is a sure sign of Christmas. The brakeman wore a piece of mistletoe in his cap and a broad grin on his face, and he said, Merry Christmas, and a way to make a man feel good all the rest of the day. No Santa Claus is there. You just ask him. And then the train rolled into the city under the big gray dome to which George Washington gave his name. And by and by I went through a doorway which all American boys would rather see than go to school a whole week, though they love their teacher dearly. It is true that last winter my own little lad told the kind man whose house it was that he would rather ride up and down in the elevator at the hotel but that was because he was so very little at the time and didn't know things rightly. And besides, it was his first experience with an elevator. As I was saying, I went through the door into a beautiful white hall with lofty pillars between which there were regular banks of holly with the red berries shining through, just as if it were out in the woods. And from behind one of them there came the merriest laugh you could ever think of. Do you think now... It was that letter in my pocket that gave that guilty little throb against my heart when I heard it. Or what could it have been? I hadn't even time to ask myself the question, for there stood my host, all framed in holly and with the heartiest hand clasp. Come in, he said, and drew me after. The coffee is waiting. And he beamed upon the table with the various Christmas face as he poured it out himself, one cup for his dear wife and one for me. The children, ah! You should have asked them if there was a Santa Claus. And so we sat and talked, and I told my kind friends that my dear old mother, whom I have not seen for years, was very, very sick in faraway Denmark and longing for her boy. And a mist came into my hostess' gentle eyes, and she said, Let us cable over and tell her how much we think of her, though she had never even seen her. And it was no sooner said than done. In came a man with a writing pad. And while we drank our coffee, 
This message sped under the great stormy sea to the faraway country where the day was shading into evening already, though the sun was scarce two hours high in Washington. Mrs. Reese, Ribe, Denmark. Your son is breakfasting with us. We send you our love and sympathy, Theodore and Edith Roosevelt. For you see, the house with the holly in the hall was the White House, and my host was the President of the United States. I have to tell you, or you might easily fall into the same error I came near falling into. I had to pinch myself to make sure the President was not Santa Claus himself. I felt that he had, in that moment, given me the very greatest Christmas gift any man ever received, my little mother's life. For what really ailed her was that she was very old, and I know that when she got the President's dispatch, she must have become immediately ten years younger and got right out of bed. Don't you know mothers are that way when anyone makes much of their boys? I think Santa Claus must have brought them all in the beginning. The mothers, I mean. I would just give anything to see what happened in that old town that is full of blessed memories to me when the telegraph ticked off that message. I will warrant the town hurried out, burgomaster, bishop, beadle, and all to do honor to my gentle old mother. No Santa Claus, eh? What was that, then? That span two oceans with a breath of love and cheer? I should like to know. Tell me that. After the coffee, we sat together in the president's office for a little while while he signed commissions, each and every one of which was just Santa Claus's gift to a grown-up boy who had been good in the year that was going. And before we parted, the president had lifted with so many strokes of his pen clouds of sorrow and want that weighed heavily on homes I knew of to which Santa Claus had had hard work finding his way that Christmas. It seemed to me as I went out of the door, where the big policeman touched his hat and wished me a Merry Christmas, that the sun never shone so brightly in May as it did then. I quite expected to see the crocuses and the jonquils that make the White House garden so pretty out in full bloom. They were not, I suppose, only because they are official flowers and have a proper respect for the calendar that runs Congress and the executive departments, too. I stopped on the way down the avenue at Uncle Sam's paymasters to see what he thought of it. And there he was, busy as could be, making ready for the coming of Santa Claus. No need of my asking any questions here. Men stood in line with banknotes in their hands asking for gold, new gold pieces, they said, most every one. The paymaster, who had a sprig of Christmas green fixed in his desk, just like any other man, laughed and shook his head and said, Santa Claus? And the men in the line laughed too, and nodded and went away with their gold. One man who went out just ahead of me I saw stoop over a poor woman on the corner and thrust something into her hand, then walk hastily away. It was I who caught the light in the woman's eye and the blessing upon her poor wan lips, and the grass seemed greener in the treasury dooryard, and the sky bluer than it had been before, even on that bright day. Perhaps, well, never mind. If anyone says anything to you about principles and giving alms, you tell him that Santa Claus takes care of the principles at Christmas, and not to be afraid. As for him, if you want to know, just ask the old woman on the treasury corner. And so, walking down that avenue of goodwill, I came to my train again and went home. And when I had time to think it all over, I remembered the letters in my pocket which I had not opened. I took them out and read them, and among them were two sent to me in trust for Santa Claus himself, which I had to lay away with the editor's message until I got the dew rubbed off my spectacles. One was from a great banker, and it contained a check for a thousand dollars to help buy a home for some poor children of the east side tenements in New York, where the chimneys are so small and mean that scarce even a letter will go up through them, so that ever so many little ones over there never get on Santa Claus's books at all. The other letter was from a lonely old widow, almost as old as my dear mother in Denmark, and it contained a two-dollar bill. For years, she wrote, she had saved and saved, hoping some time to have five dollars, and then she would go with me to the homes of the very poor and be Santa Claus herself. 
and wherever you decided it was right to leave a trifle, that should be the place where it would be left, read the letter. But now she was so old that she could no longer think of such a trip, and so she sent the money she had saved. And I thought of a family in one of those tenements where father and mother are both lying ill, with a boy who ought to be in school, fighting all alone to keep the wolf from the door and winning the fight. I guess he has been too busy to send any message up the chimney, if indeed there is one in the house. But you ask him right now whether he thinks there is a Santa Claus or not. No Santa Claus? Yes, my little man, there is a Santa Claus, thank God. Your father had just forgotten. The world would indeed be poor without one. It is true that he does not always wear a white beard and drive a reindeer team. Not always, you know. But what does it matter? He is Santa Claus with the big, loving Christmas heart for all that. Santa Claus with the kind thoughts for everyone that make children and grown-up people beam with happiness all day long. And shall I tell you a secret, which I did not learn at the post office? But it is true all the same of how you can always be sure your letters go to him straight by the chimney route? It is this. Send along with them a friendly thought for a boy you don't like. For Jack, who punched you. Or Jim, who was mean to you. The meaner he was, the harder do you resolve to make it up. Not to bear him a grudge. That is the stamp for the letter to Santa. Nobody can stop it. Not even a cross draft in the chimney when it has that on. Because don't you know, Santa Claus is the spirit of Christmas. And ever and ever so many years ago, when the dear little baby was born after whom we call Christmas and was cradled in a manger out in the stable house because there was not a room in the inn, that spirit came into the world to soften the hearts of men and make them love one another. Therefore, that is the mark of the spirit to this day. Don't let anybody or anything rub it out. Then the rest doesn't matter. Let them tear Santa's white beard off at the Sunday school festival and growl in his bearskin coat. These are only his disguises. The steps of the real Santa Claus you can trace all through the world as you have done here with me. And when you stand in the last of his tracks, you will find the blessed babe of Bethlehem smiling a welcome to you. For then you will be home. Jack's Sermon by Jacob Rees Jack sat on the front porch in a very bad humor indeed. That was in itself something unusual enough to portend trouble. For ordinarily Jack was a philosopher well persuaded that, upon the whole, this was a very good world, and Deacon Pratt's porch the center of it on weekdays. On Sundays it was transferred to the village church, and on these days Jack received there with the family. If the truth were told, it would probably have been found that Jack conceived the services to be some sort of function specially designed to do him honor at proper intervals, for he always received an extra petting on these occasions. He sat in the pew beside the deacon, through the sermon, as decorously as befitted a dog come to years of discretion long since, and wagged his tail in a friendly manner when the minister came down and patted him on the head after the benediction. Outside, he met the Sunday school children on their own ground, and on their own terms. Jack, if he didn't have blood, had sense, which for working purposes is quite as good, if not so common. The girls gave him candy and called him Jack Spratt. His joyous bark could be heard long after church, as he romped with the boys by the creek on the way home. It was even suspected that on certain Sabbaths they had enjoyed a furtive cross-country run together, but by tacit consent the village overlooked it and put it down to the dog. Jack was privileged and not to blame. There was certainly something from the children's point of view also in favor of Jack's conception of Sunday. On weekday nights there were the church meetings of one kind and another, for which Deacon Pratt's house was always the place not counting the sociables which Jack attended, with unfailing regularity. They would not, any of them, have been quite regular without Jack. Indeed, many a question of grave church polity had been settled only after it had been submitted to 
and passed upon in meeting by Jack. Is not that so, Jack, was a favorite clincher to arguments which, it was felt, had won over his master. And Jack's groping paw cemented a treaty of goodwill and mutual concession that had helped the village church over more than one hard place. For there were hard heads and stubborn wills in it as there are in other churches. And Deacon Pratt, for all he was a just man, was set on having his way. And now all this was changed. What had come over the town Jack couldn't make out, but that it was something serious nobody was needed to tell him. Folks he used to meet at the gate, going to the trains of mornings on neighborly terms, hurried past him without as much as a look. Deacon Jones, who gave him ginger snaps out of the pantry crock as a special bribe for a handshake, had even put out his foot to kick him, actually kick him, when he waylaid him at the corner that morning. The whole week there had not been as much as a visitor at the house, and what with Christmas in town, Jack knew the signs well enough. They meant raisins and goodies that came only when they burned candles on trees in the church. It was enough to make any dog cross. To top it all, his mistress must come down sick, worried into it all, as like as not, he had heard the doctor say. If Jack's thoughts could have been put into words as he sat on the porch, looking moodily over the road, they would doubtless have taken something like this shape, that it was a pity that men didn't have the sense of dogs, but would bear grudges and make themselves and their betters unhappy. And in the village, there would have been more than one to agree with him secretly. Jack wouldn't have been any the wiser had he been told that the trouble that had come to town was that of all things most worrisome, a church quarrel. What was it about and how did it come? I doubt if any of the men and women who strove in meeting for principle and conscience with might and main and said mean things about each other out of meeting could have explained it. I know they all would have explained it differently and so added fuel to the fire that was hot enough already. In fact, that was what had happened the night before Jack encountered his special friend, Deacon Jones, and it was in virtue of his master's share in it that he had bestowed the memorable kick upon him. Deacon Pratt was the valiant leader of the opposing faction. To the general stress of mind that holiday had but added another cause of irritation. Could Jack have understood the ethics of men, he would have known that it strangely happens that, quote, Forgiveness to the injured does belong, but they ne'er pardon who have done the wrong, unquote. And that everybody in a church quarrel, having injured everybody else within reach for conscience' sake, the season of goodwill and even the illness of that good woman, the wife of Deacon Pratt, admittedly from worry over the trouble, practically put a settlement of it out of the question. But being only a dog, he did not understand he could only sulk, and as this went well enough with things as they were in general, it proved that Jack was, as was well known, a very intelligent dog. He had yet to give another proof of it that very day by preaching to the divided congregation its Christmas sermon, a sermon that is to this day remembered in Brownville. But of that, neither they nor he, sitting there on the stoop, nursing his grievances, had at that time any warning. It was Christmas Eve. Since the early Lutherans settled there, away back in the last century, it had been the custom in the village to celebrate the Holy Eve with a special service and a Christmas tree, and preparations had been going forward for it all the afternoon. It was noticeable that the fighting in the congregation in no wise interfered with the observance of the established forms of worship. Rather, it seemed to lend a keener edge to them. It was only the spirit that suffered. Jack, surveying the road from the porch, saw baskets and covered trays carried by and knew their contents. He had watched the big Christmas tree going down on the grocer's sled, and his experience plus his nose supplied the rest. As the lights came out one by one after twilight, he stirred uneasily at the unwanted stillness in his house. 
Apparently, no one was getting ready for church. Could it be that they were not going? That this thing was to be carried to the last ditch? He decided to go and investigate. His investigations were brief, but entirely conclusive. For the second time that day, he was spurned, and by a friend. This time, it was the deacon himself who drove him from his wife's room, whither he had betaken him with true instinct to ascertain the household intentions. The deacon seemed to be, if anything, in a worse humor than even Jack himself. The doctor had told him that afternoon that Mrs. Pratt was a very sick woman, and that if she was to pull through at all, she must be kept from all worriment in an atmosphere which fairly bristled with it. The deacon felt that he had a contract on his hands which might prove too heavy for him. He felt, too, with bitterness, that he was an ill-used man, that all his years of faithful labor in the vineyard went for nothing because of some wretched heresy which the enemy had devised to wreck it. And all his humbled pride and his pent-up wrath gathered itself into the kick with which he sent poor Jack flying back where he had come from. It was clear that the deacon was not going to church. Lonely and forsaken, Jack took his old seat on the porch and pondered. The wrinkles in his brow multiplied and grew deeper as he looked down the road and saw the Joneses, the Smiths, and the Allens go by toward the church. When the merits had passed, too, under the lamp, he knew that it must be nearly time for the sermon. They always came in after the long prayer. Jack took a turn up and down the porch, whined at the door once, and receiving no answer, set off down the road by himself. The church was filled. It had never looked handsomer. The rival factions had vied with each other in decorating it. Spruce and hemlock sprouted everywhere, and garlands of ground ivy festooned walls and chancel. The delicious odor of balsam and of burning wax candles was in the air. The people were all there in their Sunday clothes and the old minister in the pulpit. But the Sunday feeling was not there. Something was not right. Deacon Pratt's pew alone of them all was empty, and the congregation cast wistful glances at it, some secretly behind their hymn books, others openly and sorrowfully. What the doctor had said in the afternoon had got out. He himself had told Mrs. Mills that it was doubtful if the deacon's wife got around, and it sat heavily upon the conscience of the people. The opening hymns were sung, the merits, late as usual, had taken their seats. The minister took up the book to read the Christmas gospel from the second chapter of Luke. He had been there longer than most of those who were in the church tonight could remember, had grown old with the people, had loved them as the shepherd who is answerable to the master for his flock. Their griefs and their troubles were his. If he could not ward them off, he could suffer with them. His voice trembled a little as he read of the tidings of great joy. Perhaps it was age, but it grew firmer as he proceeded toward the end. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. The old minister closed the book and looked out over the congregation. He looked long and yearningly, and twice he cleared his throat, only to repeat, On earth peace, good will toward men. The people settled back in their seats uneasily. They strangely avoided the eye of their pastor. It rested in its slow survey of the flock upon Deacon Pratt's empty pew, and at that moment, a strange thing occurred. Why it should seem strange was perhaps not the least strange part of it. Jack had come in alone before. He knew the trick of the door latch and had often opened it unaided. He was in the habit of attending the church with the folks. There was no reason why they should not expect him, unless they knew of one themselves. But somehow, the click of the latch went clear through the congregation, 
as the heavenly message of good will had not. All eyes were turned upon the deacon's pew, and they waited. Jack came slowly and gravely up the aisle and stopped at his master's pew. He sniffed of the empty seat disapprovingly once or twice. He had never seen it in that state before. Then he climbed up and sat, serious and attentive, as he was wont in his old seat, facing the pulpit, nodding once as one should say, I'm here. Proceed. It is recorded that not even a titter was heard from the Sunday school, which was out in force. In the silence that reigned in the church was heard only a smothered sob. The old minister looked with misty eyes at his friend. He took off his spectacles, wiped them, and put them on again, and tried to speak. But the tears ran down his cheeks and choked his voice. The congregation wept with him. Brethren, he said, when he could speak, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. Jack has preached a better sermon than I can tonight. Let us pray together. It is further recorded that the first and only quarrel in the Brownville Church ended on Christmas Eve and was never heard of again, and that it was all the work of Jack's sermon. "'Twas the Night Before Christmas by Clement Clark Moore "'Twas the night before Christmas when all through the house "'Not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. "'The stockings were hung by the chimney with care "'in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. "'The children were nestled all snug in their beds "'while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. "'And Mama in her kerchief and I in my cap "'had just settled our brains for a long winter's nap. When out on the lawn there rose such a clatter, I sprang from the bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the new-fallen snow gave the luster of midday to objects below. When what to my wondering eyes should appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer with a little old driver so lively and quick, I knew in a moment it must be St. Nick. More rapid than eagles his courses they came, and he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen, on Comet, on Cupid, on Donder and Blitzen, to the top of the porch, to the top of the wall, now dash away, dash away, dash away all. As dry leaves that before the wild hurricane fly, when they meet with an obstacle mount to the sky, so up to the housetop the coursers they flew with a sleigh full of toys and St. Nicholas, too. And then in a twinkling I heard on the roof the prancing and pawing of each little hoof. As I drew in my head and was turning around, down the chimney St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed all in fur from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of toys he had flung on his back, and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack. His eyes, how they twinkled, his dimples, how merry, his cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry. His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and the beard of his chin was as white as the snow. The stump of a pipe he held tight in his teeth, and the smoke, it encircled his head like a wreath. He had a broad face and a little round belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, or a right jolly old elf, and I laughed when I saw him in, in spite of myself. A wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his work and filled all the stockings, then turned with a jerk and laying his finger aside of his nose and giving a nod up the chimney he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team gave a whistle and away they all flew like the down of a thistle. But I heard him exclaim ere he drove out of sight, Happy Christmas to all. And to all, a good night. Thank you for listening to the 3324 Podcasts Holiday Treasury Volume 2 with Sean Grady, Nick Leshy, and Dean Legiro.